Hey, John here. Let's use these buttons here to see if we can control a module that can create a tri-state driver on an output pin. A big thanks goes out to all the supporters of my channel, especially the VIP patrons listed here. Thank you very much. I'm gonna look at some code today that's in the Verilog examples directory. If you watch my channel, you should be familiar with this. These files are under the SBIO subdirectory, specifically these tri-state example applications here and here. I'll put a link to the repo in the description on YouTube so you can clone your own copy if you want to. We have two different versions of a tri-state output driver one of them uses a pure Verilog style of design. The other one uses a, uh, let's just say, a manually instantiated hard IP block called the SBIO on the ICE40HX chip that I'm experimenting with today. Let's do the regular Verilog one first. Normally, this is all I would ever use, except for one problem. In the readme file, I mentioned that Yosis ignores the pull-up resistor when we create what we called an inferred tri-state output. And I want the resistor to be enabled, or I want to be able to enable the resistor, if that makes sense, okay? So let's see here, top.v. And a pure Verilog thing, what we got here is nothing particularly interesting. We have two buttons that I'm going to mess around with here. We got S1 and S2. And it says in the dock up here, when S1 is pressed, it goes active. It's active low. As we talked about this 2057 board before, when you press the button, it goes to a zero. When you release it, a pull-up resistor will pull it high, and it'll look like a one. Same thing with S2. And the way this is supposed to work is S1 controls the output driver. If S1 is pressed, the output driver is turned on, and then the output on a pin of the FPGA that we configure in the PCF file will be set to whatever the value is from S2. When I press S2, the output will, what does it say, the output will be driven high. When I release S2, the output will be driven low. Both of these buttons are active low, so I have to invert them in order to make that happen. Uh, Yosis does not include the pull up, and this is the problem. If the PCF file specifies that there should be one there uh, on outputs when it uh, that it it, uh, it it infers are supposed to have a tri-state driver. So this is a shortcoming in the current version of Yosis. It's unclear if and when they'll fix that, but there's an easy enough workaround that we'll see in a minute. So another note about Yosis here is that it's not real smart about the tri-state drivers. It'll only do them as far as I know if you use a ternary operator along the lines of this, okay? So this is a really simple application. I got the two LEDs are directly connected up to the LED. Uh, the, two, two, the two LEDs that go on and off are directly connected to the switches. The LEDs light up when there's a zero coming out of a pin, and the S1 generates a zero when you press it. So when I press these buttons, the LEDs go on. You saw that in the beginning of the video, okay? Now, we also can say, I'm going to invert S1. The trailing N notation, you see that in some apps, that means that it's uh, negated. It's active low. When it's zero, it is true. And to me, that means if I press the button, I want this whole expression here to become true. So I can put a tilde in front of the negated one, right? Okay, so when I press S1, I want it this to be assigned to D out. When I release S1, I want a, a high impedance output to be assigned, okay? So I press S1, the value in S2 should make the output go high and low. When I release S1, D out should be floating. And because the PCF file says and I already warned you it doesn't work, it, I want the pull-up resistor in the FPGA to be there. 
So in, other, in the end, what we would have is when it's floating, the FPGA provides a pull-up resistor, so I don't have to put one in my circuit externally. It's a big space saver, and when you need a lot of them, like an entire data bus or an address bus, oh my gosh, it's nice not to have, you know, 24, 32, or even more, you know, resistors on there just providing pull-ups if the FPGA could do it yourself, Right. So we need to make sure that we can use these when we want to. And if we want to put it on a tri-state bus, it's a problem with Yosis. You'll notice I have them here on these push buttons, and they work fine. Why? Because these are just plain old inputs. And they, and they do work fine in that case. If they didn't, the switches, when you release them, may not look like a binary one. If it really is floating... The input on the FPGA may, may just float to ground, which looks like a zero, right? All right, so let's take a closer look at what's really going on inside the FPGA. We saw this earlier on when we were looking at the HX40 uh, uh, family reference guide. That's what this is, the data sheet. I'll put links to this below in the description on YouTube as well. You can get directly into this. Uh, the long, more, more securitous route to get there would be to go back to the Verilog examples here, by the way. And then in here where it talks about this uh, latest F, uh, FPGA docs for the ICE40 chip family, which is what I'm using in this example, can be found right here. The two manuals you're going to see in this video today come from right here. I'll put the link to this thingy on the YouTube description. Like I said, I'm going to scroll down here. Blah, 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 blah. They got all the warnings of what's happening. You can see the TN26 and the, uh, the regular HX family data sheet is here. It's this 029. All right, just to make sure everybody's got their bearings. I cannot stand it when someone glosses over something like this and it takes me three hours to find it, especially when it just took me that long to find it. And I already knew what I was looking for. Anyway, I'll let it go. You know where to get the doc now, all right? Okay. <laughs> this is what we're looking at. This is the, the family data sheet, not the, um, the, uh, the logic, uh, the embedded hard IP manual. So this is what a pin looks like. Now we're going to see three different diagrams, unfortunately, none of which are entirely complete because that's how the documentation likes to work. If you only read one manual, you're pretty much done and you're never going to get it to work. This one I show you because it shows you where the pull-up is and how it's connected. This is also very abstract, and the rest of this gives you a nice description of the ice gate hold feature that they brag about and they talk about, and then they kind of bury it in the other manual, and I'll show you how they implement that in a minute. What we care about today is this pull-up resistor. We want to be able to turn it on and off, and it's a simple, like a switch in here, a simple FET or something that'll cause you to be able to engage this pull-up resistor that's just connected to the pin pad right here, all right? Now, on any output, it'll come through this gate, and it'll drive the pad, but any input will flow through here, okay? And you can then connect this up to the LUTs and stuff and the switching fabric inside the FPGA, now, all FPGAs have stuff like this. Some of them have pull-up, and they also might have a pull-down. And they, they all have just different features. That's why we have different FPGAs. So we'll choose the one you want based on the features you need and or the price you're willing to pay. Because these things can cost thousands of dollars if you want a gigantic one with a lot of fancy features. Or, you know, a couple of bucks for the super cheapos. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of malarkey in here. Output enable, output signal with a gate and multiplexers and a, enable logic to turn the output on and off. And this is the key for a tri-state bus, okay? If I want to write data out to it, I want to turn on this driver so that the signal here is copied out onto the pin, no matter what, whether I have this driver on or not, I can always sneak a peek at what's going on on this pin by sending this through here and, and reading it on the signal over here, which is really handy. And this is basically the extent that we want to do this today. We don't really care about um, 
the ice gate hold or the use of this flip-flop here or the one down there or the one these are for other features that i may never even use okay this thing does a lot more stuff than i'll ever need we just want the simple uh input output and let the output flow and be able to turn on and off this pull-up okay so this is the diagram that sees the the big picture in the abstract now here is the same stuff with a little more detail in the Tech Library Tech Note Manual. This is the FPGA Tech Note 2026 uh, up here, okay? Again, there'll be links to both these manuals in the general lattice page you saw earlier, so you can get your own. Now, this one gives you a little more detail. And you want the detail because you don't really know necessarily what the configuration settings are supposed to be. See these circles in here? You have the ability to specify whether you want a 1 or a 0, for example, on that AND gate right there. I got an ability to specify a 1 or a 0 on the signal over here. And so on down here and there and there. And, and this is a pretty simple chip, okay? And the fancy ones have a lot more going on. So, okay. What you see here, these are the bit position numbers. And what we can see is a, a bit vector called pin type on the SBIO hard IP module. It's one of the configuration parameters you can spec when you instantiate one. Now, when Yosis runs, we didn't instantiate an SBIO, and we're not specifying these. And this is where you get to this whole inferred thing. Yosis has to figure out what you mean, what you want. It does a pretty good job. The question mark and you assign a Z value to the output. What it's doing there is it's connecting that signal up, that, that, that the, the ternary operator, when it decides what to put on this output enable, it'll create a mux over here, and it will decide whether the output enable is supposed to be on or not, what, but depending on whether I assign a Z to the data output bit over here. And it will toggle this thing on and off, and it will configure this MUX so that the signal here goes through that MUX, goes down here, and operates the driver on this output uh, driver here, okay? So five and four, it will infer you meant to put a uh, one zero in there, it looks like, okay? So if you put a 1-0 in here, or it infers that you meant to put one in there, you can put a signal on here, and when it goes 1 and 0, it's it's turning on and off this output enabled driver thingy, okay? Perfect. Then you've got a signal over here on out 0, and if you connect all the magic dots, and you float it through this mux, and then you run it through that mux there, that signal will tell you whether you want a 1 or a 0 coming out of the pin. And because this is drawn upside down from the previous view, the input logic is up here. And if you look in this really interesting circuitous thing, if you go here and you turn on that input in this box, it floats in and around in a big looper down here. And input zero can be directly connected, if I so want, to allow me to take a peek at what's on the pin, regardless of whether I'm driving it or someone else is. Okay? What's missing in this diagram is the pull-up resistor that goes right here. Why, I do not know, but they decided not to show it in this particular diagram. The third diagram is down here, and it's not super duper relevant today, but I want to let you know that you can see it. What's this one? This is Oh, that's the GBIO. Oh, it's not in this manual. It's in the other manual. Okay, the, uh, the, 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 the HX family document has this abstract diagram, and this is the other one. See where it says PIO pair? Some of the pins can be operated in pairs, and the idea is you can you know use it to create a differential signal or something like that, or you can use it for whatever you want. I mean, their design intention might be one thing, but they give you the detail and they show you how it really works. And what makes these a pair is nothing more than the fact that these three wires here that come up and over there are shared on two separate pins. 
But otherwise, you can see there's no wires running up and down in this diagram here, okay? The idea is that you've got this clock enable, an output clock, and an input clock. These things control these, uh, these, these latches, these flip-flops in here. And you can make use of this uh, for synchronizing the changes to these two pins if you want to. You can use it to latch the data output values or the data input values at different times. And they're in pairs because if you look closely, you can then use it for double data rate, which means you're clocking a value in on the leading edge of the, of the input clock and then another data bit in on the falling edge of the input clock. And because these run down to both of the pins here, both neighbors, I say three wires, there's two, I'm sorry. Uh, that, then these operate as a single unit with regard to these uh, clocks and the clock enables. If you don't specify these at all, they default to just saying it's always enabled and you can ignore it so that you can use the generic direct bit in and a direct bit out, which is closer to what we're doing today, all right? But I just wanted to see uh, those three diagrams, get bird's eye view of what has to happen inside this chip in order for it to function, and to make sure that you don't get disoriented by the fact that they leave out the pull-ups when they're actually there, and we can actually see that they're there by running some tests, and we'll see that in a minute. All right. So here we are, top.v. We're just looking at all this fun stuff. Let's compile and load this on the board and watch it go. And what I want to do is I want to see, I want to see that this thing tri states when I release S1. If I press S1, this expression comes true, and the output will be assigned the value currently uh, from S2. As I press it, it'll, it'll go to a 1, and I release S2, it would go to a 0, okay? And I should be able to play around with button S2 with S1 released, and I should see nothing happening on D out. It should say still. Wherever it is, it should stay there. And it should be high because there's supposed to be, as you see, a pull-up resistor, although there isn't because of the way this thing works, okay? But there should be a pull-up resistor, and it should look like it's high when I release switch 1. Whenever switch 1 is pressed, whatever I do with S2 should come out, okay? All right, there we go. Make uh, world, I, I like to do it like this. I think I've shown you this before. That ampersand over here means take both standard error and standard out. Anything that this make operation, the compiler, or anything running has to say that it prints to the terminal, no matter what, shove it into the less command, which will let me scroll through it so I can see what's going on. I can also search. And I happen to know if it prints the word warning or error, it starts with a, cop a capital letter and the rest of it's lowercase. So when I do this, I search for A-R-N-I-N-G in order to see my warnings. And there's one. It says uh, combinational network. I got one and only one real error. There's no clocks. That's fine. What's going on? Oh, there it is. Okay, so... There, I said error. I meant warning. Tough morning for me. Morning. It's a warning morning. Anyway, the uh, Yosa says a limited support for tri-state logic at the moment. Blah, 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 blah. And this is the issue that will crop up. It says uh, regarding line 55 of top.v. So if we re-edit top.v, and I think I've shown you this once before on my channel. We might not have gotten into the details, but this is line 55 as it says right there okay so it says by the way that may not give me what i want and in this case it does not it's close it's close enough for most some apps all righty so here we have we saw this a minute ago i press the buttons you can see the two leds going on if i darken this a little bit maybe it'll be easier to see that LED is going on and they both work. I can push them both down or one at a time, whatever, okay? Now, what I want to do is put my scope on output uh, 143. As we saw earlier in the PCF file, I set 143 to be the thing that I'm driving with this design. That's the, the out, the D out signal. I'm going to ground my scope right there. 
And pin 143 is right here. I don't know how well you can make that out on the this particular camera shot, but I think it's okay. There's my 143. All right, now if I look at my scope, I see it's currently low. Now, if I press S2, I see the LED go on. I still see my scope is low. I release it, I toggle it, the scope stays low no matter what. I press S1 and the scope is low. If I press S1 and S2 at the same time, my scope goes high. If I hold down S1 and I release S2, the scope goes back low again. And if I, you know, tap S2 like this, its scope is going up and down the way I would expect it to, all right? So when S1 is pressed, and the output driver goes on, it does appear to be doing the right thing. It'll drive it up, it'll drive it down. When S1 is released, it looks like it's low, but I can't really tell, just because it's got zero volts coming out of it, doesn't mean that it's driven to ground. It could be floating, and the you know even though the scope has high impedance input here, it may be that it's mildly pulling it low, and that it looks like it's at ground. So if I touch it with my hand, not always a good thing to do. You can see the scope generates kind of a, a weird picture from a ground loop that's being generated by my body. Okay, so that suggests to me that it really is floating. Another way to do this is to take a resistor like I have here. It's on these leads, and these leads I can hook up to whatever pins I want. So this is a 33K ohm resistor, which I determined by a little bit of experimentation uh, is what I believe to be the size of the pull-ups inside the FPGA when they're engaged. Now I'm driving pin 143, so I'm going to put this resistor up to 143, and I'm going to put my scope probe on the pin side of this resistor. All right. So I'm going to look at the pin with my scope, just like we did before. And the other end of this resistor, you got to be careful I don't short everything out. Um, oop, no, this wire popped off. got to be careful. <laughs> All right. So the other end of this resistor, I can pull to either 3.3 volts on this last pin here or ground. All right. First, I'm going to tie it to 3.3 and see what happens. On my scope, I can see the trace right now is at 3.3 volts. It's high, and that's because the switch one is released. If I press it, the scope trace now goes low, as one would expect when I have the output driver on, and I go back to the, we saw what we saw earlier. If I hit this switch here, it's going 1 and 0 and 1 and 0, as one would expect when S1 is down. So that's working, and this resistor is providing a pull-up. Now, this is not a complete test. It sort of is. It's enough to believe, but let's now put it on the ground and pull it to ground. Now what do I got on my scope? It's low. I press the S1 to turn on the output driver. It stays low. While S1 is down, I can toggle S2, and it's going up and down like I did before, as one would expect. So what this does to me is it proves without a doubt that there is no pull-up resistor on inside this FPGA, because if there was, this resistor here would be acting as a voltage divider right now when I pull it down to ground like this. Now, let's look at something else here. In one of these manuals, always talks about banks. There are I.O. banks here, 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 and here. In fact, there's an, a bank for the SPI interface that is used on the HX uh, chip uh, chips solely to read the flash boot ROMs. I only mention it in this context because it's on the diagram for completeness, all right? So what we have here 
And then what, they, what these are for, see how they have a separate VCC for each one of these? The idea is when you design them with FPGAs, even these cheapo ones, you can operate each of these banks with different voltages if you want. I can be running 3.3 volts here, 3.3 in the SPI. I can be running 1.8 and 2.5 volts, whatever you want. Really neat. Not that I'm taking advantage of any of that right now. I have mine configured so every single one of these is running at 3.3 volts right now because I don't have any interesting things to do with the other voltages, okay? But because of these separate banks and almost all, I've never seen an FPGA that does not have features like this. By that, I mean these banks have different uh, voltage uh, domains. So VCC IO1 is only providing the voltage for bank one, and I can have different ones for the other ones. Now, notice this one over here. It says special LVDS IO. Now, these manuals talk about this LVDS IO. It stands for low volt differential signaling, I think. And in order to do that, they suggest that bank uh, three over here does not have this pull-up resistor. Presumably, it would interfere with your ability to operate the LVDSIO. But this is an interesting issue, okay? Because that suggests that if I happened to have chosen uh, an I.O. pin that was in bank three over here, I shouldn't have a pull-up resistor anyway. Why don't we double check that? Now, on the uh, Lattice Dock site, one of those links is uh, for the pinouts for the uh, ICE 40 HX chips. And uh, this is the one for the HX 4K, which is the one I'm using. See where it says Bank 3 here? Look at this. Pin number 1 is in Bank 3. We were hooked up to pin 143, which presumably is at the bottom of this file. Uh, which is in bank zero, all right? Now, it would have made a certain amount of sense to suggest that, you know, I'm in bank zero, I should be able to engage that pull-up resistor. And if, you know, Yosis didn't have this, this feature, it probably would have done so. But should also be, Possibly, if I chose one that was in bank uh, three over here, it might not have a pull-up resistor at all. So it, it would behave exactly like I've just shown, but I didn't. I was on pin 143. Now, I mention this because, where is it in here? It's somewhere in one of these manuals. It says if you're on bank three, there is no pull-up. IO buffers do this. They support these different standards. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, LTL. Oh, come on. Is it actually? It might actually be in this code right down here. Uh, type pull up. There you go. By default, the IL will have no pull up. This parameter is only used on bank 0, 1, and 2. It is ignored when it is placed at bank three. This is what I was referring to. This notation, by the way, if you've been watching my channel, I've been talking a little bit about Verilog and kind of how to get started. This notation I had not mentioned yet. If you look closely at what this is, it's an example of here's how you can use this. Well, that's great, but look what this is doing. It's creating, it's instantiating a module of hard IP. They're going to call it IOPIN inst. And these are all the ports and what they're going to be connected to in your uh, the module that instantiates the SBIO. Now, normally, I don't use this notation down here. Normally, what I would have done, these things down here, my point is, if you want to specify the pin type, and it's pretty important that you do, what I would have done is I would have put the parameter overrides up here. I would normally create the module by saying this is the module name. Then I say pound open parenthesis. And then you can say dot pin type and then put this in parentheses along with the ports. Okay. So they've done it a different way. What they've done is they've created 
Uh, they've instantiated the module, then they reach into the module because you can use this hierarchical naming convention that says, look, I want to define the parameter value of the pin type parameter of the IO pin inst module to be this value here. So you can create it and then reach into there and poke at it. And, but this is a parameter, mind you, not you can't do this with a signal or a port. This is only useful to, you know, to specify constant values, which are the only values you can use for parameters in this I.O. module. All right. So uh, if you're going to read this, you don't recognize this. That's what they're doing. You're going to see me do it a different way. I prefer more consistent manner of here's all the ports and then here's all my parameter overrides in this uh, first set of assignments up here. And you've seen me do that before as well. But that's what this means. All right, so there's the, the note that I was channeling uh, about the, that's not it, it's this one up here, the, about the uh, ignored pull-up resistor, okay? So arguably, maybe that was our problem, except for the fact that we're on 143, which is not in bank three, okay? So what do we know? What do we learn from this? The ternary operator, by the way, if you don't know what that means, let's go back in here real quick. Ternary operator refers to the question mark. And the reason it's called ternary is because it has three operands. This is the ternary operator. It has this conditional expression over here. It has this value here, a colon, and then it has another value over here. And in like C programs and languages like Verilog, this is the only one that has, is actually ternary. So we refer to it as the ternary operator because there isn't any other ones. <laughs> so everyone knows what you're talking about, okay? But this is a conditional evaluation type expression here. It's an if then else. And Yosis, to that point, only recognizes the, the tri state output when you use the ternary operator like I did here. If you rewrite this using an always block and you put an if this, then d out equals this, else d out equals this over here. Of course, you'd have to make D out a reg in order to do that, but we've talked about that before. If you use that other notation, then Yosis will get confused, and it won't do what you want, okay? It needs to be like this, at least in the current release that I've been using. And I don't know of anything, uh, any scheduled updates to change that anytime soon, okay? So that's what's going on with this. It does work, except it won't let you turn on the pull-up resistor in the PCF file. So let's go over to here. This is the exact same program, but this time I'm going to create that pin myself. And exactly what I was just talking about. I'm going to use this SBIO block. I don't have a ternary operator in here. You can use ternary operators for other things too. By the way, if you're just getting started, don't let that derail you, okay? It's just that if you want Yosis to infer uh, you know, a tri-state output, you have to do it that way. Uh, that's all I'm referring to there. Uh, let's take a quick look at the doc, make sure I don't forget anything obvious, manually configure the thing, see this document here, that's what we were just looking at. What do I got here? I got the usual same port. This is the exact same code as before, I just copied it over here, deleted the ternary operation and stuck this in here. I created a signal called driver enable so that I have a nice place to put some comments and things because I have to invert this. But, you know, I'm just being, it's just a little more verbose. You can just put tilde S1N in here and it'll be fine, I'm sure. Uh, what are we doing here? I'm going to specify the parameters here rather than down here, like you saw in the manual. And I'm only going to hook up these pins. I don't have, you don't have to hook up stuff you're not using. It'll just leave them disconnected. Uh, this value here is the interesting thing, all right? We'll look closely at this in a second. But from a bird's eye view, the key here is I have this pull-up parameter specified with a one, and I comment it out. We can flip this back and forth and see how it behaves. And I have this pin type defined. And if we go back to, if we go back to our manual, the pin type, package pin, and the pin type we see the parameters documented down here. 
So I specified the pin type. He set it to zero. I set it to something else. You got to pull up. You can set it to a one or a zero. I'm not going to use the negative trigger, and I'm not playing with I.O. standards because the HX doesn't have a way to change them anyway, and there's nothing on the next page hiding. Okay, so I'm only going to specify the pin type, the pull up. So where do you get this value from? Well, the value there comes from deciding what you want in all those bits that are assigned to control the multiplexers in that detailed diagram above this. You can also kind of look up and see what you want to do if you can understand what these words and descriptions mean, because it says, look, if you want to set, you know, uh, I don't want to have any output at all, set it to zero. If I want to send it to an output, which is just a regular, as they say, simple output pin with no enable. In other words, just connect the signal up to the output pin, leave it on all the, or leave the driver on, I should say, all the time. And when the signal goes up and down, the pin goes up and down. This is a very generic output. Here's a tri-state one. This is getting closer to what I wanted to use. But if you look through all these, you got enabled things with DDR. And remember, I'm talking about DDR and all those latches. You got to make sure that one of these doesn't have some weird feature in there that you actually do use, but it's named in a weird way. Pretty sure this is the one we want because nobody else says anything about tri-state. Uh, and then up here, we look at the other two bits in there. I want an input. I want a latched input. I want a registered or I want a DDR. Yet, I'm running an output. Output is not even an option. It's a two-bit value with five possible cases. How is that even possible? Well, it turns out that case number three is zero, zero, and case number five is also zero, zero. So they have two different meaning. Okay, this is why you look up here. Almost always, I try to do it the easy way because I'm lazy, just like everybody else. And then I got to revert back to look at the darn schematic and figure out what's going on, which is why they give it to you in the first place. Now, this is drawn by someone that really wants you to fail. Look very closely at this bubble right there. Let me zoom in on it. <laughs> Two comma three. This represents the value that goes into the pin type parameter. Three to two. These bits, when, if I wanted to make this mux have a zero, and this one have the one, you know, the address input, I don't put a zero one in these bits. I put a one zero, because three is the most significant bit here. This wasted 10 minutes of my time the first time I looked at this. But I've become oversensitive to assume that everyone who's ever drawn a diagram is an idiot. So I always have to look super close. Still, I miss these things. Very annoying. So I'm waving my hands here. Don't get confused because they decided to label this one backwards. It, it turns out that, pit, that, that the bit in position three does go to this gate, go, does run to that mux, and two goes to this mux. It would be worse, honestly, if they flipped it around the other way. I suppose they could have reversed these uh, wires and the diacro. I, I don't know. Uh, it, this is just... It threw me. Don't don't lose yourself on that, okay? Okay, and here's pin 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2 shows up in two different places, okay? Now look. These two bits up here affect only the input logic. And because what I want to do is I just want to look at what's coming in and I don't care about anything else. I want this signal to go through this mux around here and I want to get it from D in zero. These are the signals. These are the ports, I should say, on the SBIO module. And these bits, this thing here, are the parameters of that module, okay? So to get the pin input to go through here, come around the horn this way and come out over here, you want a zero one to come in on the address lines for this mux here, right? So you want a zero here and a one there. Now you can go ahead and look and see what other impact that's gonna be, but the short of it is if there's a zero going to an AND gate here, the output will be zero. So the left bit here is zero. That gives you the zero there. And to differentiate between these two inputs, you got this one there. So as long as I got a zero here and a one there, 
the pin input will come routing through here and come on D in zero. That's done. Now you got this ugly thing down here. The bottom one's the easier one. The output enable is the thing that we need to control. We need to make sure that it is routed to control the driver enable bit on this buffer here. So all you need to do is make sure that bits five and four are set to one and zero respectively. That'll allow me to control this driver and that's what we want. Now, pins two and three, which three is the most significant bit, I want, we already know what we want to take this out zero signal and run it up and around through these muxes. So pin three needs to be a one, pin two needs to be a zero. Now pin two also controls this mux down here, but I don't care because it doesn't go in here and it doesn't matter what this thing's doing. I just want this line here to come in and around through there. So what would we got here? We got five and four should be a one zero and three and two should be at one zero. So these two bits should be one zero, one zero, and then the least significant two bits should be zero one. If you go down here and you look at the zero one simple input pin, that's all we want. We want to be able to look at it if we want to look at it. We don't need any special features and latching or anything else on the inputs, okay? So that's right, and that makes sense. Good name for it. Now, what was the other one? We wanted a one zero, one zero. So, which one of these is one zero one? It looks like this one right here. It is the tri-state. Uh, what does it say about it? The output pin may be tri-stated using the enable. That's exactly what we want. They call it case number three, but it's binary value number 10. Again, you know, these people that write these things just should have their head examined. And the editor and the reviewer and whoever signed it off after that guy. Uh, it's Our job is not <laughs> hard enough as it is. <laughs> oh, my God. So once you get through all of that, uh, what do we got here? There's the 1010 and the 01 down here. This underscore in here, if you watch my channel, I don't know if I've ever used this notation before. It turns out you can put underscores in your, um, like your hex and your in your binary constants and stuff like that. The underscores are completely tossed away and ignored. The idea is this is the same as that value there, okay? The idea of having them there allows you, because sometimes I mean, you got got maybe a 32-bit binary number that's in many different groupings. It, by allowing you to just put this thing in here to demark the different sections of the digits, it allows it to be a little bit more readable. And we do know that the least significant two bits run the, uh, what do we say, the input logic and the, these bits there control the output logic. So that's it makes it easier uh, to read. It's the one thing that they do help you with. <laughs> so, all right. So there's the pin type and how we control that. And if you want to play games, knock yourself out. You don't have to use it for what it says down there. You have these bits. You can control them. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and 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 get whatever features you want out of this chip. Like I could use that latch if I wanted to by routing it through here and, and reading that. I don't have to use any of the other features when I do that and hook up these pins, whatever I want to do, you know. Uh, and, and it's all up to the only real options you get is to be able to specify the bits for the things in these gray circles. All right, so I also have the pull up on. Now, that means when I create this SPIO block, the pull-up is on. It's on, period. I don't have a PCF file crap. There's nothing inferred. This is explicitly created, explicitly configured. Do this. Make it so. It's the Captain Picard of, of uh, configuration here. This one's commented out because we can flip it back and forth and see what we want to do, uh, see if it does anything interesting. And here's the ports. i got a package pin. This has to be connected to a signal that's connected to a pin ultimately on the chip. Otherwise, it, it'll you'll get a compilation error. And I connect it to my signal called D out, which is a port, and it's an output wire because that's where I'm going to be driving my um, the output from this, 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 this block here, right? Uh, I have a driver enable signal, which is an internal thingy in the module, and I got the 
S2 pin, uh, or rather the, the button for S2 connected to the D out zero line. So when I press it, the output will go one and zero when the driver enable is true. So what we got here, we hook up the LEDs to the two switches, just like before. And I set the driver able to true when I press S1. So now I've mechanically, I've physically implemented the exact same thing we just saw before. But because I can specify the driver, uh, or rather the, the, the pull-up resistor on the SB block, I can control it rather than have the compiler ignore it from the PCF file. So I didn't even put it in here, but it, whether I do or not, it doesn't matter because this uh, output will be connected to the SBIO in the top module, as you see here, and it will be configured as I say, not as I imply, okay? So what is this doing? It's hooked up to pin number one right now, and that's on bank three, which according to the other doc is not supposed to have a pull-up resistor. And yet, <laughs> uh, I think we're gonna find out it does. Oops, let's go ahead and compile this. All right, well, do we have any warnings? Same one we always see. No clocks, no clocks, nothing interesting here, okay? Do we have any errors? No. All right, make prog. Let's see what happens. All righty, let's move this over to pin one. Well, actually, let's disconnect our pull-up, okay? I'm gonna leave this wire here floating and unconnected, all right? And then I'm gonna take the other one, the gray one here, and I'm gonna hook it up to pin one. So what I'm doing is I got my scope on pin one, and the other resistor and stuff that's in there don't do anything because it's not hooked up to anything. And I look at my scope in this state right now, and I can see that the trace is high. So somebody's either driving that output high or there's a pull-up pulling it high. And it's not mine because mine's not hooked up, okay? Now, if I press S1 and I don't press S2, I see the scope go low. And that makes sense because I'm not pressing S2. If I press S1, the driver goes on. S2 is not pressed. It should be sh sending out a zero. If I press both buttons at the same time, I can see the output go high, and I release S2, it goes back to low, high, low, as I press and release, this is perfect, that's what it should do. But now we're back to the question, is it driving it high right now, when both buttons are released, or is it being pulled up by a resistor inside the FPGA? Well, if I connect up my 33K ohm resistor to ground, and I look at my scope, we can clearly see that I now have a voltage divider. I'm looking at about 1.6 volts on my scope, which is halfway to the 3.3. So if I have a 33K ohm resistor here from ground to the pin, and then inside the pin there's a pull-up resistor that's a 33K going to the VCCIO, which is 3.3 volts, it should show 1.5 volts now. Okay, so this suggests very strongly to me that there's a pull-up resistor engaged right now on that pin, and its value is or close to 33K ohms. If I press S1 now, it goes to ground. I press S2 at the same time, it goes high. I release S2, it goes ground, high, low, high, low. This is perfect. That's what it should be doing. That's what the other application should have done as well because it should have inferred that I wanted a tri-state and it should have used the PCF constraint and so on. So now this is the only way I know of to get the pull-up resistor engaged on a tri-state, you know, I'll put driver with YOSIS, okay? The regular tools, the commercial tools and stuff don't, I've never known any other system that has this problem. This is just an, an artifact of YOSIS. Now, let's move this pin over to 143, run the test again with another pin out of another bank, and maybe, because who knows, maybe the doc is wrong and they got the bank numbers wrong. All right, let's go for 
143, which is in bank zero, and run the whole thing again. We boot it up and it's high. We press and release S1. It goes low because the driver's on, and then we release it. It goes back high again. We then press S1 and we play around with S2, and it's going 10101. Works fine, just like it did in bank three. So, okay. So banks three and zero both have the ability to turn on pull-up resistors in spite of the fact that the other manual buried in there says it does not, but it didn't really say that, you know, which chips it was specifically talking about. It was just talking about the ICE-40 in general, and we know that some of the chips have, like, high current driver outputs, and some of them don't, and some of them have different features. So the manual might have... Um, left out a, a footnote <laughs> suggesting that some chips work that way and some of them don't. Now let's go back and do the one last test here. Do this. Just for closure, let's not turn on the pull-up resistor and see it. what this does. I submit this will work exactly the same way as it did with the inferred tri-state driver. And if I, if I touch this resistor or something like that, or if I hold the wire in my hand without connecting it. You can see the scope has like a wobbly signal on there. So it's definitely floating. But we can also hook it up to 3.3 volts. While nothing's being driven because both the switches are released. And we can see the output of that pin is high. We connect it over here to ground. And we can see that it is pulled down to ground. Now... I try not to ignore manuals when I my research proves them otherwise. What I would do in this case, let's leave it on 143. The you know, if it says it's not supposed to work on bank three, you may want to avoid using it on bank three. Sometimes vendors will do stuff like that, and it, maybe it, it should work on bank three, but it turns out maybe some of the pins in bank three don't work, so they just say don't use it on any of them. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't tell you why, other than maybe, uh, like I said, the dock covers multiple chips. It was poorly phrased. They should have had a footnote. It could be any reason why they don't bother to tell the truth. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they don't know either. Uh, all right, so, okay, so what do we learn here today? What we learned is, first of all, read all the doc before you get to, if you ever get stuck on something, you look around to see if you can find another manual that sort of talks about the same thing and maybe uses different words, you get some insights into that. Uh, we also know that Yosis does not want to behave, and this is documented. This is a well-known feature. It's in the Yosis like, uh, user's guide that and it, it generates a warning to let you know that's very nice that they did that that uh that this pull up resistor that they that uh, ternary operators and tri state outputs don't always work okay be very careful test very well if you want to infer a tri state output with a question mark operator in your verilog code uh, what I'm going to do is not do it that way <laughs> I'm going to use this style if and when I want to create a, tr a pin with a tri-stated signal on it, okay? So, you can, you know, turn on and pull up or not, but you can explicitly tell it exactly what you want it to do. You want to use the other options, knock yourself out, do some experimentation. Maybe there's other things you can get out of it that will help you in other ways down the road. We'll come back to the SBIO in the future, but for now... And I, it's nice to know that we can drive the output, we can read the input, we can tell it what mode to go in there, we can enable the output driver and turn that on and off with an explicit signal, and we can control this uh, pull-up. All right? So that wasn't what I wanted to make sure that everybody got a hold of today in a nice, neat little package. Mm, little as it can be on my channel. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.